Yes. As the itinerary, uh, uh, you know, says today we should be here and we are here. Uh, my brother over here, I'm Tuesday born, he's a Sunday born, Friday, Friday sorry, Kufi Friday born, and um, he's a, uh, what do you call, the curator of this place. I'm so happy to have him, and uh, he will take us through all those places and tell us whatever they have. And then, uh, uh, to the museum, whatever. Then after that, you give us a lot of time for us to take some pictures. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, so once again, welcome Africa for Africans group. Thank you. I think every other year, I meet this group, and I'm always honored to have a tour with this group because usually it's very interesting and interactive. So, as you said, my Name is Kofi because I was born on a Friday. Kofi. Yes, as a male. And this is the memorial for the first president of Ghana. He was called Kwame in Chroma. Kwame in Chroma. And Kwame because he was also born on a Saturday as a male. Now you get to learn, you get to learn as you, you, you visit that in Ghana, especially in the south, the day of the week you are born is like a spiritual name for both male and female. Now, the reason why we have the monument on this particular grounds is that during our colonial period, this was where the British used to play polo. So it was called the old polo grounds and meant for only British. Natives or locals like us were not allowed to come here. So when it was due for us to gain independence, symbolically, and also to kind of spite the British, Kwame Nkrumah chose the same grounds where he made his independence speech. So that's the importance of the memorial built on this particular grounds to the history of Ghana. So as part of our tour, we're going to visit the museum where we have his pictures and some of his personal stuff. And there's also a mausoleum where he was eventually laid to rest. And we have his statue and other ones on the side. So what I want to do today, a bit different from Monday, is to give the, brief de the details over here. Then from there, we'll walk around and have a look at all the monuments that I'll be talking about later. Perfect, now, that'll look, work. Yeah. And Dr. Nkrumah was from the western part of Ghana, a town called Nkrofo. He was born on September 21st, 1909. And since 2009, his birth date has been part of our national public holidays. It's called the Nkrumah Memorial Day. He had his early education around his hometown, but was trained as a teacher in Accra, a school then called Prince of Wales College. We now call it Achimota School. He finished, taught for a while, but eventually he got a scholarship to study in the US. So he went to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania State for his undergrad, where he studied economics, sociology, and theology, and also joined a fraternity. He was a member of Phi Beta Sigma fraternity as a student at Lincoln. Yeah, he was. Now, after Lincoln, then University of Pennsylvania for his master's degree, where he read education and philosophy. After UPenn, he went back to Lincoln to teach in African history and languages. And even in the early part of 1945, he was voted Professor of the Year at Lincoln. He left the US eventually late 1945 to England for his PhD at London School of Economics. Two years in England, he got invitation from the first political group here to return home and help the struggle towards independence. They heard about him because whilst in England, he got himself involved in organizing some Pan-Africanist conferences. So he became very popular. So they invited him to come. So he joined the group. They were called the United Gold Coast Convention. 
and he became their general secretary. A year and a half later, he left that group to form his own political party, which was called CPP, or Convention People's Party. He left because at a point, he was saying independence or self-government now. He was very radical. But his friends were saying later. So because of that, he left the group to form his own political party, CPP. And to put pressure on the colonial government to give us independence, he then declared what he called positive action against British colonial rule. By that, he was organizing a series of demonstrations against the British for them to give us independence. But that unfortunately brought some chaos. So they, get, they got Kwame Nkrumah arrested. He was charged for treason or tradition, uh, sedition, allegedly. And then they put him in jail. He was kept at James Fort Prison, which is just down the road here. But whilst he was still in jail, our people were putting pressure on the British for him to be released. That forced the colonial government to organize elections to elect people into our first national assembly. And luckily for Kwame Nkrumah, his name was added to the ballot as a candidate, even though he was still in jail. When elections were over, he actually won. So he got elected while still in jail. So they had to release him prematurely from jail. And he was only released because he got elected. He came out and became leader of government business worked with the colonial government until it was due for us to gain independence. So symbolically, he chose this ground where he made his speech on the eve of 6 March, 1957. And at that time, Ghana was the first country south of the Sahara to get independence from British colonial rule. So when he was making his speech here, Amongst what he said was that, quote, the independence of Ghana would be meaningless unless it was linked with the total liberation of the African continent. Yes. Yes. And that it was time to prove to the whole world yes. that given the same opportunity, the black man was capable of managing his own affairs. Make mistakes and correct them, yes. and of course. So and among those who were in the crowd, Listening to him was Martin Luther King Jr. Uh -huh. Now he came when Nkrumah made his independence speech. So he became our prime minister while the Queen of England remained our head of state. Until three years later, Ghana became republic. Then he was sworn in as our first president on July 1st, 1960. So he led us, he was one of those who had strong socialist views. So all his policies were in that particular direction. But that unfortunately over time got him on the bad side of some key Western countries, the US especially. So at the point the US government held back foreign aid to Ghana because of Cameron Kome's socialist position. And that also made him to look elsewhere for aid to build his country which got him closer to most of the key communist countries. So the Soviet Union, China, and Cuba. So at a point, the US government branded him a communist because his friends were communists. Also, um, he was among those who believed and promoted strongly African unity, what we call pan-Africanism. So eventually, a founding member of our current continental union, the African Union. But they also said that political unity alone amongst African countries was not enough. And that we must also unite economically and protect our mineral resources from continuous foreign exploitation. That over time made him a threat and a biggest target for Western attack. So unfortunately for him in 1966, 24th of February, his government got toppled. There was a military and police coup d'etat against him. He was then not in the country. He had taken a trip abroad. 
he was then on his way to Vietnam, among those helping to intervene in the then Vietnamese war. But he left here upon the request of the US government. So whilst he was away, conveniently, some of his army generals took over the reins of government. Conveniently. So he couldn't return home and had to go into exile Man, in Conakry, Guinea, where the Guinean government wholeheartedly accepted him and made him their core president because Dr. Nkrumah also helped Guinea for them to gain independence. So when we rejected him, they accepted him as their core president where he lived till eventually he fell sick. They took him to Bucharest, Romania for proper medical attention. That was where he died of prostate cancer in 72 at the age of 63. So they embalmed him in Romania and took him back to Guinea where he was given a state funeral and burial as co-president. But then three months later, they transferred him from Guinea to his family house because at the time he died, unfortunately, his mother was then still alive. And he happened to be the mother's only child. So she requested they brought him home. That was where he was until when Ghanians thought that he deserved a proper national honor for all he was able to do for us and the continent at large. So this was built in 1991 by our then head of state, now late Jerry John Rawlings. So when he finished here, he was then transferred from his family house to this place. So this happens to be his third and hopefully his final resting place. You may ask why the coup? Now, at the middle part of his room, in the 60, uh, early 60s onwards, um, he was having some challenges with some of his people, some of our people. Now, for whatever reason, attempts were made to assassinate him locally. So that also made him to pass a law, which in a way led to some arrest, some of his key political opponents. So then people were beginning to call him a dictator. Also, in the mid-60s, there was a national referendum that made Ghana like a one-party state. So these are the two reasons that was used locally to justify the coup against him. But it was much later that the true picture and reason actually came out. It was after some of the files of the CIA were declassified. That showed that the whole coup was locally staged but foreign funded. With the US heavily involved in it. For two reasons. The fact that he was a socialist and most of his friends came from the communist bloc. So, being close to people like the late Fidel Castro of mm. Cuba, um, Chairman Mao of China, and Nikita Khrushchev of the yeah. Soviet Union was a big deal for the US. So, one reason why they never liked him. And also, the fact that he was among the, he was the one leading the cause of Pan-Africanism, saying things like Africa is for only Africans, mm -hmm. and that we must unite and protect our minerals. Yeah from continuous foreign exploitation yeah. was a threat and still is a threat Absolutely. because they are here obviously because of that, the minerals. So he's saying that, and he was so influential on the continent and the world stage, so he saw him as a threat. So the soldiers who staged the coup, we later found out what were actually paid to do that because they saw him as the biggest threat to Western interest in Africa. And that is why he was eventually overthrown. And to give a more practical expression to his talk about Pan-Africanism, he married an African. His wife was Egyptian, called Fateha in Chroma, but their marriage was also politically arranged. It was done by the then Egyptian president, that Jamal Abdul Nasser. It was kind of an attempt to unite Arab Africa to black Africa. Um, they have three kids out of the marriage, two gentlemen now and a lady. But before he married his wife, 
he had a son from an earlier Ghanaian relationship. So they are all four. And the kids are all surviving. Um, his older son is a retired oh. pediatrician in Ghana. The second is a journalist in Egypt, whilst his only daughter and younger sons are all politicians in Ghana, but in different <laughs> political parties, not on the same side. Oh. Which is which? Oh. The daughter belongs to his party, CPP, whilst the younger son supported the current president during our, our last elections. So they are on opposing sides. Oh. Yes. Now, when we came out of the bus, some were attracted to the broken statue there. Now, that was one of his statues, which was made after independence. Originally, it was complete. And this used to stand in front of our old parliament house, just across the street here. But during the military coup, some of his things, I would say, were vandalized by some ignorant Ghanaians. So the statue was attacked and we lost some of the parts. Even the broken head sitting next to it used to be mixed, missing. It was only 2009 that somebody returned it. Yes, it happens to be a woman we are told was one of his supporters. So more or less, she found and kept it safe for all these years. Until, um, until times change. Yeah, times change. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yes. yes. And, and she never wanted to be known, so we don't know who she really was. And she took a lot of risk yeah. by doing that because it, be, it became criminal for anyone to be seen having anything of him wow. after his overthrow in 66. So she took a lot of risk by keeping the head of the statue till now. That is why the head is separated from the body, just to tell the story of what really happened. So are some Ghanaians regretting what happened because Kwame Kum is obviously it's a, a legend and Amen. all the work he has done is just passed on to, In fact, to breed new generations of revolutionaries. That is why he was honored with this memorial. Now before and prior to the coup, he was also accused of being corrupt. And all sort of things were said just to justify the coup against him. So obviously after the coup, there were a lot of investigations, more or less to go into some of these allegations made against him. Fortunately or unfortunately for them, nothing of such sort were found. Whether or not he was corrupt, he never had even a single house to himself. And the only residence he had that was taken away by the state was eventually returned to the family because the issues of corruption and arrest were all proven not to be true. It was only a way of making him look bad to his people. And that is why, so that is why it was thought that he deserved a proper image repair. That is why this monument was eventually built to honor his image. And he happens to be one of the most visited, he's the most visited attraction site in Accra. So just in Accra, this is where most people visit, especially school kids. Yes, family, I'm proud to To say. learn much about our first President Dr. Nkrumah. I'm mean, proud to say I've been here 19 times. Yes. <laughs> and so you, you also observe that there are a lot of trees planted here. Some of the trees we see were planted by some prominent people, mostly African heads of state, who come to pay homage with him and then were made to plant trees. So this shady one, for example, was planted by the former president of Namibia. It's called Sambi Joma. This was planted in 1992. We have a tree planted by the late Nelson Mandela of South Africa, um, Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe, uh, the former Kenyan president, Moi Kibaki, um, Dos Santos from Angola, and other African heads of state. Yeah, but we also have others from European leaders. Also, this is the memorial to pay respect to him. So, from here, we walk to where his statue is mounted, and then we pay our respect at the mausoleum where he's laid. And as also mentioned that the mausoleum also have the, has the grave of his wife. His wife died in 2007 Egyptian in Egypt, wife. Which one? the Egyptian wife. Mm -hmm. And not long after she died, the news came from the children that during her last days, one of her wishes 
was to be buried next to the husband. So that was discussed and eventually agreed by the government of Ghana. They, they brought her body back, gave her also a state funeral, and eventually they returned her also. So we also have her grave next to his. So let's see. Uh, yes, family, what a wonderful introduction. Yes, yes, powerful. And what we're going to do, family, now is show you what we're talking about, the memorial. Right there with a strong black star. And we're gonna get you a little closer to the actual statue. It's the Ghana, the black star of Africa. And as you can see, it is a quiet day at the park where the only ones are here. <laughs> but that's what we do, family. Sometimes you show up at places and it's just us, us our group. I'm just uh, zooming in the shirts. That was emotional. Mm -hmm. That was very emotional. Yeah. I was. Okay, when they, when they pack you, let me know. Hello? I Africa for Africans family. Our famous t-shirts, you see them in all different colors. Green, gold, black, yeah. red, mixed in all different kind of ways. Can you just explain the sheep, the symbolism of the sheep? Oh, absolutely, man. I, li I like the Aki tree over here. All right, so for those who don't know what this is, it is an Aki tree, and in Ghana, for my knowledge, People do not use this, but in Jamaica make akin saltfish or akin fish or akin codfish or akin whatever you want to mix it with. And this is it right here. Yeah. So these are the trees you grow up at climbing and it's you know you're born with a philosophy and the idea that literally you're eating off the land, you know, you're growing trees on your property the way you can eat from nature. And one thing about Ghana, just everything grows here, so sometimes I can't even keep up with what. I can't think of anything that doesn't honestly grow here as far as tropical trees. The shape of the mausoleum got its own symbolic meaning. Now from up to the base, the shape looks like a tree stump. It's like a tree growing, but then cut up in the middle. What meaning is that he couldn't finish what he was doing for us before he was overthrown. So more or less, it represents Dr. Nkrumah's unfinished work. Because the tree was not allowed to grow. And also in our villages in Africa, often when our farmers are from their farms and tired, they rest under a shade of a tree. So it's buried down there, and we believe that he is also resting under a shade of a tree. And the black star up there stands for all black people, a symbol adopted from Marcus Garvey. Thank you. I want to get you. Thank you. I want to get one. Wait, wait, wait. No, you want to? Okay. Come on, Karen. Everybody else get in here. Oh, family, do your thing, and family will meet you right there at the statue for a group picture. Okay. Just organize a group picture of the statue. Brother Yao, enjoy the pictures. 
It's a family. We're gonna get you over here by the statue. And uh, one of the nice things is when water is all in here and the water is just going. I've seen it a few times. It's always a sight when the, the water and everything works. I've but seen it a few times. We have some funding to renovate. So from next month, we're gonna renovate the whole park. By our next trip, you see that we're gonna see them working. They're perfect. All right, so. Oh, okay, we just um, I, I just keep on forgetting that independence is recent. So this is probably where it was put up for independence. Yeah, that's a, that's a replica of the stage on which he stood. Yeah, I, know, I was looking at one of the pictures. It was uh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at one of the pictures, and they had a few of his uh, people in his parties there. That, yeah. This was powerful. Yeah. I think this is the second time I've seen this set up here. It's a family, this is a park of a legend and the good thing about it, uh, we went through the lecture about the statue and the memorial. <laughs> so now we're just waiting for our group to come so we can get a group photo. And then we're gonna take you to the museum where we don't have, we can't do any footage in the museum, which is the only place that we're not allowed to shoot on our entire Ghana tour. The legend, the man himself, Kwame Nkrumah. Or, you know, one of those people that are like great inspiration. You know, when you think about, you know, you think about Dr. Martin Luther King, you think about Malcolm X, and you think about Marcus Garvey, you just think about this inspiration from great minds and you know, warriors that just literally add to this, you know, do the work and, you know, and stick to their, you know, their flow as far as this. What has to be done, do what has to be done to get it rolling and inspire the rest of us. So as time come along, we need those of us to be the next generation of this movement. So as we share with you all of this history and culture, let me understand that as time go along, we need more and more people to step their game up and be that representation for us to build black economics and straight nation building. So the foundation of Kwame Nkrumah and all the other great minds I mentioned is that foundation we're building on. And when you come to Ghana, this is one of them places where I always come, been here 19 times. And that's the show, you know, just like every time I come here, I go to the Holocaust dungeon. These are places of our incredible reconnection. Darling. <laughs> And as usual, family, zoom up on Africa for the African shirt. And <laughs> it's a turn around. I'm taking a picture of you also. I got you right there in the zoom. You got me? <laughs> okay, so family, where Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's statue is built, <laughs> where his statue stands, was exactly that spot he made his speech for independence on 6 March 1957. That is pure bronze, molded in Italy. And his posture means forward ever, backward never. Amen. Which is a slogan of a political party reform, CPP, or Convention People's Party. Forward ever, backward never. Now the home blowers are expressing an aspect of our traditional culture. In Ghana, especially in the South, when we have oh, a festival or yeah. uh, a big occasion, okay, babe. and the chief or the king is coming, yeah. often some of his servants would go before him, go pronounce his arrival. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when an important person dies, traditionally, we blow horns to announce the person's death. So symbolically, we are doing the same thing for him. But the only difference is that they blow the horn in real life while standing. They don't kneel, they stand and blow. But here they are kneeling because they are giving him honor or respect. All right. And when you come down to, we got some of them on each side. And to us, the number seven represents the completion of creation. That's seven days of the week.
Oh, perfect, appreciate it. Uh, family, can we j come on up and join for a group photo up here? Since it's only a few of us, uh, we can just probably take it all at the top. So let's all put this way. Stand up here? Yeah, we, for those who can, yes. Um, okay. We can, you can all be up there. Like, let's have the yeah. Yeah, yeah, And family, as we close in this video, I just want to show you a nice view. And you're limited, but literally behind this memorial is the Atlantic Ocean. And also, further over this way is the Arts and Culture Center, which we're going to go to next. <laughs> Brother Yao! Okay, okay, alright. 